sentiment or opinion before or after 2014. So here there is a, a sort of a steep increase in the quality of these papers. So the first uh, paper that worked on ordinal classification by sentiment, according to a number of stars, dates back to 2005. Uh, in 2006, we have the first very large comprehensive sentiment lexicon. And 2008 is, is the first investigation of aspect-based sentiment. Okay? So trying to mine, say, from product reviews of, say, hotels, what is the sentiment uh, towards a certain hotel about its cleanliness, about its value for money, about different aspects of the hotel, which is a big thing today. So its sentiment analysis is difficult. Okay, so from 2005, I mean, pretty much every company in market research was offering its sentiment analysis package. How can it be, you know? So that must, be, must mean that sentiment analysis is easy. No, I mean, sentiment analysis is what I would characterize as an NLP complete problem, okay? So in order to solve sentiment analysis, you pretty much need to solve and actively solve, I mean, all other problems in, in NLP. And it is inherently difficult because you know, when it comes to expressing our emotions, opinions, etc., we normally use all of the kind of expressive array of expressive means we have, you know, and including very <coughs> subtle and sophisticated ex expressive means. Okay? So we use irony, we use sarcasm, we use metaphors, we use understatements. You know, and these are even, you know, culturally motivated, okay, so, I mean, the British use understatement much more than the non-British, for instance, okay, so that's very difficult. <coughs> so here I've collected the three statements which are rich in opinion, okay, so they are extremely negative statements about three different uh, objects, okay, so one actor, another actor, and a perfume, and you might uh, realize that uh, all of this, okay, none of this essentially uses any adjective which is sentimentally charged, okay. So at that time, Clint Eastwood had only two facial expressions, with the hat and without it, okay. So that's a very bad statement for an actor, okay, but there is no, you know, derogative adjective, okay. So she runs the gamut, or the gamut, I don't know what it's pronounced, of emotions from A to B, you know. Usually people say she, she can express all emotions from e, A to Z, you know, but from A to B means that you have a very small range of, you know, emotions that you can convey as an actor, okay? If you're reading this because this is your darling fragrance, okay, a review of a perfume, please wear it at home exclusively and tape the window shut, you know? So again, I mean, I challenge you to figure out at least one adjective which is emotionally charged, sentimentally charged here. So it is very, very difficult to, to figure out uh, sentiment here because in all of these examples, there is a lot of irony, there is a lot of sarcasm. Well, you might say, I mean, but, uh, you know, statements, emotional statements where there is sarcasm are a minority. It's not really true, you know, because it's um, the statements where sarcasm is a minority are the ones which are, you know, super heavy in sarcasm, you know. But in the number of uh, statements which are opinionated, we use irony or sar sarcasm to even to a small degree, you know. So, you know, sentiment in general is very hard to recognize, it's very hard to catch. So, uh, in general, I mean, the sentiment analysis area is, is as I said, I mean, a, a sort of a galaxy of tasks, you know. And here are the main tasks that, that you, might, uh, you might find in the literature. So, the, the sort of the queen of, of uh, the sentiment analysis task is sentiment classification. So, that means uh, picking a piece of text based on whether it expresses a, either a positive or a neutral or a negative sentiment, okay. So that, that's pretty easy. So another task, which is actually uh, sort of an ancillary task, so it's sentiment lexicon generation. So it's determining whether a word or, say, a phrase, a multi-word, conveys a positive, a neutral, or a negative stance. Okay, so positive words are fantastic, marvelous, good. Negative ones are, um, you know, disastrous. And, uh, you know, neutral ones are, say, triangular. So 
Of course, I mean, this is a task that has no interest in itself, okay, but uh, it has interest in the fact that it is an, a sentiment lexicon is an enabling technology for carrying out all of these other tasks. Okay? So a sentiment lexicon is, as we will see, fundamental to many other tasks. So uh, another important task is sentiment quantification. Okay? We have seen text quantification earlier. Sentiment quantification is given a set of texts, estimate the proportion, estimate the prevalence of different positive, neutral, or negative sentiments. Such as you know, when Nokia looks at tweets about its latest uh, phone. You know. Opinion extraction is, is an even more difficult task. It's also called fine-grained sentiment analysis. And the idea is given a sentence which is opinion-laden, opinionated in a sense, identify the holder of the opinion, identify the object, identify its polarity, whether it's positive or negative, identify the strength of this polarity. Is it very positive, very negative? Identify even the type of opinion, because the judgment can be, say, a functional judgment, such as, you know, the, the, this tablet has a very wide angle, you know, or it may be a moral judgment, you know, it may be an aesthetic judgment. So there are very different types of opinions or judgments. Okay? And uh, another task which is, has picked up a lot of importance recently is aspect-based sentiment extraction. Here the idea is not, not just to mine the sentiment about a certain object, but also to mine the sentiment about different aspects of this object. You know, the hotel room, we want to evaluate it for value for money, for location, for cleanliness, for, for various different aspects. So let me look uh, at so at least a couple of main such tasks. Okay. So sentiment classification is, as I said, I mean, the most important of these of this, uh, opinion mining tasks. Typically, what we do, I mean, we, we do, we work on the topic uh, biased uh, versions, okay, which means uh, find items that express an opinion about the topic, okay, and then classify them by sentiment towards the topic, okay, because, I mean, sentiment, generic sentiment is not really uh, interesting. Again, I mean, there are very different versions which have binary, ternary. Binary means positive versus negative, ternary, it adds in uh, neutral or, or, or lukewarm, ordinal, you know, is one star through five stars, which tends to be an industry standard nowadays. And sentiment classification, again, can be carried out at different levels of granularity. So you can have a sentiment classification at the sentence, at the paragraph, or at the document level. Okay, so typically people would uh, like to do, say, sentiment classification at the more granular level in order to use this as evidence, in order to, to use the results as evidence towards, you know, doing at the less granular level. So you first classify the sentences and use the results in order to figure out the overall sentiment of the document. And the main difference is whether it, uh, this classification is supervised or unsupervised. So this might come to you as a surprise, okay, because up to now, I mean, in text classification by topic, we have just seen supervised text classification. So how does unsupervised go about? So unsupervised was the very first uh, type of sentiment classification that was, you know, proposed, etc. And um, the, the basic idea, you know, is to rely on the sentiment lexicon. The sentiment lexicon, again, is, you know, a dictionary of, say, words, and each of these words is marked uh, as being uh, positive or negative or neutral. Well, the very first uh, super naive approaches that were attempted, they simply counted the number of occurrences in a sentence. Okay, the occurrences of the positive words, the occurrence of the negative words, and if the ones, the positive ones, outnumber the negatives, then the sentence was deemed as, as you know, uh, positive. Well, I mean, this uh, at least, I mean, was a bit uh, tempted to outperform the random baseline, but that was not enough. Okay? And so many of the er early companies, I mean, advertising sentiment analysis products did something like this, okay? Something like this means uh, doing this plus, you know, a few, you know, heuristics that can improve the results such as, I don't know, measure the distance between the sentiment carrying word and the word denoting the topic, okay? Because the closer it is, the more likely it is that the, you know, this adjective, you know, in, indeed qualifies the topic, okay? 
bring to bear what uh, linguists call valence shifters. Okay, so <coughs> valence shifter is you know particles that tend to invert or something like that the polarity of a word. Okay, so such as not, hardly, negation context. Bring to bear magnifiers, you know, diminishers, you know, such as very, extremely, fairly. Okay, so I mean all of these are heuristics in order to improve over you know, the, the very basic, uh, unsupervised approach of counting positive and negative words. And of course, I mean, also using word sensing ambiguation and syntactic analysis, other levels of linguistic processing, in order to really determine whether detective sen detected sentiment really applies to the topic or to something else. So this is the basic pattern of unsupervised uh, sentiment classification. Supervised, of course, I mean, works in a way that, that is more similar to, to, the one, to the one we have seen before. You know? So the idea is that here, this is a single label text classification task you know, with the, the sentiment-related polarity as the classes. You know? As I said here, I mean, what are the technologies from the first hour of this lecture that we can use? Certainly, bag of words I mean, doesn't lead you anywhere. For because of the example that I actually quoted earlier. So sentiment classification is indeed you know, a task where you need to bring in quite substantial linguist NLP processing, which is very unlike you know, topic, uh, classification by topic. In classification by topic, many you know, attempts at bringing in you know, NLP into the picture have uh, failed. To the point that uh, uh, there is one paper in the literature, in the topic classification literature, that whose title is NLP found useful in at least one text classification task. So that was big news, you know. <laughs> and uh, I mean, people uh, actually joked saying, like, every time, you know, we fire a linguist, our accuracy improves, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, this was in order to say that NLP brought in very little contribution, if any at all, to topic classification. The picture is completely different in sentiment classification because, you know, in order to express sentiment, you use kind of linguistic devices which are com much more sophisticated than for expressing, uh, you know? So, Essentially, I mean, via the use of parsing other NLP technology, I mean, you can bring in features that are much more expressive, much more, you know, uh, much more useful, you know, for, for the task. Uh, let me come to, to this other task, which is sentiment lexicon generation. So as I said, I mean, the, everyone within sentiment analysis recognizes that the sentiment lexicon is the key component of each sentiment analysis task. Okay. So, I mean, the early sentiment, sentiment lexicons were small, you know, were pretty small because, I mean, even if we, say, have large dictionaries, you know, such as, I don't know, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of English, I mean, if you go to the Merriam-Webster, you don't find words annotated according to whether they convey a positive sentiment or a, or a negative meaning, okay? So the idea is that this kind of dictionary do not exist in, uh, in nature, and either you go for a small one, which is handcrafted, or you automatically generate one via, from, from some uh, data set, you know? So, I mean, there are very many different uh, sentiment lexicons, okay? So, some of them are at the word sense level, okay, because they, recog they recognize that uh, the same word may have different senses, and different senses might have a different sentiment polarity, okay, so sentiment word net is uh, such an example. Some of these lexicons are medium dependent, okay, so recently, I mean, people who do sentiment analysis for Twitter, they have their own sentiment lexicons which are Twitter specific, because, I mean, people using Twitter use you know, a lot of slang, you know, and a lot of uh, sentimental, sentiment charged words which are Twitter specific. Some of them are domain dependent. Okay, so, I mean, how to express, you know, positive uh, reviews in, uh, in the financial world is different, okay, uses different words, different terms than in, in the general, uh, in general English, you know. And, of course, I mean, many of them are for languages other than English, okay? So, you know, English was the first one where, of course, I mean, where sentiment lexicons were, were generated. 
but nowadays, I mean, in each major language, you tend to, to witness, I mean, papers coming in and describing the generation of, uh, uh, of these, these lexicons. So, I mean, how do we generate these lexicons? Okay, so there are, from data, there are very different intuitions that can bring to bear. Okay, so for instance, I mean, the, the very first one that was used is the fact that if you find the use of conjunctions okay, within uh, corporal <coughs> text, they tend to denote same polarity or opposite polarity, such as cozy and comfortable, and here would denote the fact that the two adjectives have the same polarity. While when you use both, but, you know, you tend to denote the fact that the two have opposite polarity. So, I mean, people started out with these intuitions. Another one is that adjectives that are highly correlated to adjectives with known polarity tend to have the same polarity. So this was a seminal paper by Peter Thorne and Littmann in 2003. Other intuitions, I mean, synonyms that tend to have the same polarity, you know, while antonyms have opposite polarity. Pretty obvious, you know. Sentiment classification words, okay, so you, you may want to classify a word, you know, as whether it is positive or negative, by simply classifying its textual definition in a dictionary, say in word, okay. Or, I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, when you have a definition, say you define uh, magnificent to be very beautiful, so there is a tendency, I mean, the words which are being defined tend to have the same polarity of, as words that are used in their definitions. I mean, if we factor out, you know, valent shifters, negative context, etc. So all of these kind of intuitions, okay, so were used in order to generate, generate, uh, uh, automatically generate dictionaries. And this is quite important because all of these intuitions are language independent, okay, so they tend to replicate across different languages and they, they allow you, I mean, to easily generate a sentiment lexicon, say, for Urdu, even if uh, one doesn't exist. The main problem for sentiment lexicons is that you know, the polarity of words is, uh, is often context dependent, okay? So there is very, it is still very much an open problem of how to, to deal with this problem, okay? So warm blanket is different from warm beer. So warm blanket tends to, have to, to be a positive connotation. Warm beer, you know, unless you're British, you know, uh, it tends to have a negative connotation, okay? So low interest rates versus low return on investment, okay? So then the latter is negative. Low interest rates is even, you know, positive if you are the person who borrows, you know, it's negative if you are the person who loans, you know. So it's, it's even more, more complicated. So I have how many minutes? Five. Yes. Five, okay. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm about to, to finish, okay. So another task, I mean, which, uh, which I believe, I mean, is going to, to become more and more important in, in the next years is sentiment quantification. Okay. So it's, uh, it, it uh, you know, arises, I mean, from, the, from recognizing the fact that uh, many, many people doing sentiment analysis and sentiment classification do it with, uh, with an eye towards the aggregate results than towards the individual results. So, I mean, people who do sentiment classification of tweets, they are hardly interested in, the, in one single tweet. They, they are not interested in the fact whether I, you know, tweet something positive about the iPhone 6. I mean, companies are interested in mining these results in order to figure out the percentage of people who positive, who, who you know, tweet uh, something positive about the, IC, the iPhone 6, and they are interested in figuring out, you know, how these kind of percentages evolve in time, okay? So, I mean, to figure out a time series of, of these kind of percentages. Okay, so the idea is that um, in quantification, what you are actually interested in is in estimating the percentages or better estimating a distribution, okay? So here in this plot, blue is, uh, this is the percentage of uh, very negative reviews, okay? So, the blue bars indicate the distribution of uh, the product reviews across a certain data set across the five classes. 
while the red one, the red bars, indicate the estimated distribution. Okay, so quantification has to do with uh, estimating a distribution as accurately as possible. As accurately means where the red bars are as close to the blue bars as much as possible. Okay. And indeed, I mean, the issue is that there are algorithms that uh, perform quantification in a much better way than if you simply classify all items and count the results. Okay. And uh, why is this so? I want to give you an intuition. Because, I mean, many, say, even if you have a classifier which might be very accurate, it might be very accurate, but still, but still err on specific on one side. So may make uh, many more false positives than false negatives. Okay. So this tends to generate an inaccurate estimation of the prevalence okay, of, the, of the proportion. While if you have a classifier which is even a bit less accurate, but which is much more even in the number of false positives and false negatives for a certain class, that's much better, because if these two numbers are the same, then the quantification accuracy is perfect, okay? because false negatives and false positives cancel each other out when it comes to counting the proportions. So sentiment quantification is going to be important. You know? And here, just to, to show you wh where the problem lies, you know, here this is a temporal trend you know, across one year of documents that belong to a single class, which is in a data set, uh, in a Reuters data set, class C12, where um, essentially on the, on the x-axis we, we see you know, the temporal progression, on the y-axis we see the percentage of documents falling into, into the class. Blue is the true percentage. So you can see that different algorithms approximate the percentages to a different uh, degree. So uh, green, is a support vector machine, a support vector machine which is optimized for classification accuracy, while red, which is much better here, is a quantification algorithm. So an algorithm which is optimized for estimating proportions. So I mean, trying to, to kind of apply this kind of quantification specific algorithms to, to sentiment uh, uh, analysis, I believe it will, you know, sort of become a big, uh, big thing in in the future. So let me, I guess I might, uh, uh, I might uh, finish, okay, my lecture by actually pointing to you, I mean, to those of you who might want to engage in research in, uh, in this field at uh, a number of shared tasks that are now open, okay, so I mean, there is a lot of uh, current work in sentiment classification and especially uh, this is, uh, I guess, that there is probably more work in the NLP field than in the IR field. And indeed, here there are a number of, uh, of tasks. I should have actually mentioned that these tasks are actually within the SEMEVAL uh, competition. SEMEVAL is to NLP what track is to IR. And a number of tasks uh, within SEMEVAL have to do with um, sentiment analysis, some of them with uh, some of them with tweets, you know, some of them having to do with quantification, some of them having to do with the ordinal dimension, etc. You know, so there is quite a, a lot to, to play with, I mean, if you're uh, interested in engaging into this kind of research. Let me finish with one minute, you know, on what are the advanced topics, where are the interesting research problems, okay? The automatic generation of context-sensitive lexicons. I have already mentioned this, okay? So coming up with the fact that, you know, some words have uh, a certain polarity in some contexts, a different polarity in others, you know? Using, uh, coming up with uh, dictionaries where the lexemes, the words, are sort of complex objects. I want to give an example. To me, I, I feel uncomfortable with the idea that a word has a polarity. So what, what kind of polarity does the word, the verb to confess has? I don't know, I mean, because wh what you confess, you know, is usually something negative, but the act of confessing itself is something positive, okay? So it is 
probably the case, I mean, that, you know, words should be seen, you know, as complex objects which have complex uh, aspects themselves in terms of sentiment. Making sense of sarcasm and irony is an overwhelming problem. I mean, there are data sets of sarcasm now, so, I mean, there is plenty to play with. Of course, I mean, also the fact of detecting emotion and sentiment in audio and video is, is a big problem. Here, one interesting cue is the fact that you can use uh, non-verbal features, okay? So something that doesn't make its way into written text, okay? So when, uh, say, I get interviewed by a customer satisfaction company and I shout, you know, it means that this is probably a, I have a negative attitude towards the product I'm being asked for, you know? So that's a kind of non-verbal feature. Yeah. So cross-domain sentiment analysis is also quite important, okay? Because cross-domain, tries to say, well, we learn to do sentiment classification for the domain, say, of DVDs, you know, by leveraging training data from the domain of MP3 players, okay? So this, uh, this is a type of so-called transfer learning and has to do, of course, I mean, with the problem that, you know, in many different domains, there is a lack of training data. Training data are expensive, okay? So this is yet another application that has to do with the lack of training data. And uh, the, the, this application too, you know, cross-lingual sentiment analysis, train on English and, and you know, exploit on Urdu, you know. And uh, of course, I mean, here the additional problem is that, you know, cross-lingual is also cross-cultural because the way the British express sentiment is not the same as, you know, the, the way the Mediterraneans, you know, uh, express sentiment. So, I mean, there are lots of many difficult uh, challenges here. Lots of low-hanging fruits to, to pick for you. I think here I have some further reading and uh, I would like to, to finish my lecture here. Thanks for bearing with me and this is the moment for questions if you have them. Yeah, I know you are an expert on this. <laughs> No, it's, it's true. I mean, so uh, management is some time. I mean, especially some companies, you know, uh, me by management mean we'll do something for, for your for your problem and mean they, they will we will plant fake reviews you know but uh, you know I take your point I mean it's not so. it One, one problem might, might be recalling a given product, you know? I completely agree with you, you know? So, I mean, I don't want to give an impression that online reputation management is something negative, okay? So, I, I simply meant that one of the aspects that, that uh, companies who do, you know, management, uh, some of them do, is actually planting uh, fake, uh, you know, fake reviews or fake sentiment-laden uh, uh, data, yes. Was another question down there? Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for the interesting presentation. You mentioned several times in your uh, in your talk uh, that lack of words is a kind of uh, problematic representation. How uh, do you explain that it is still the dominant one across information uh, retrieval? It is uh, still um, the dominant uh, one across uh, information retrieval because, uh, uh, let's say, topic is still the dominant dimension across information retrieval. And because, I mean, bag of words tends to be fairly effective at capturing the topic while it is not effective at, ca at capturing other dimensions. Okay, so it's, uh, you know, topic, uh, I mean, 
the topic you talk about is very much identified by your choice of words and by your choice of con so-called content-bearing words. Okay, so content-bearing words, <laughs> it, it's a sort of a vicious circle, but we, we call content-bearing words everything which is not, you know, a stop word, you know, an, a, a, an article, a preposition, etc. And content-bearing words is actually a synonym of words which identify topic, you know. And uh, so, to me, I mean, uh, I, I think that uh, of all the dimensions that I mentioned, I mean, topic is the easiest to capture, and which means that it is the one, you know, which can be, you know, detected via the, the use of uh, the easiest type of representation. Other questions? Yes? I think the most difficult part of Kant's mathematics is normalization. I mean, the normalization. Yeah, normalization, the preprocessing of text. But uh, I had some problems on it in my own language, and uh, I just wanted to know about a different aspect or different uh, methods. Uh, Uh, by normalization, you mean uh, word length, uh, sorry, document length normalization? Yeah, cor actually, correcting Cor the uh, user generated text. Correcting. Yeah, correcting and also uh, uh, turning into a formal language. Uh, I think that's, that's a very difficult uh, problem. And then Carlos Castillo uh, also mentioned I mean, this problem when he came up with this uh, example of a tweet which contained a lot of uh, slang. Okay? So indeed, I mean, the problem is that, uh, uh, you know, some of the slang has now consolidated. Okay? So the use of uh, the letter U to mean U the use of the letter R to mean uh, the verb R, etc. But a lot of slang is still idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic you know, to, to smaller segments of the, the Twitter uh, user population, etc. And it, it's very difficult to catch. So something that, uh, uh, I don't know which language you were looking at, but uh, at Turkish. Turkish. Uh, the, the only thing I can do is to point you at the work uh, that people like Alan Ritter have done. So, I mean, there are, there are people, I mean, who, I mean, there is one group at CMU, uh, one is the Alan Ritter's group, etc. So people who have uh, built, you know, tools that then they have released in the, in the open domain, you, you know, to, sorry? Did you mention Opla Zach? Sure. If I what? Opla Opla? Oh, Kemal? Kemal Oplater? Yes. Uh, I was, well, I know Kemal, but I was not aware he has worked in Twitter, you know. Uh, but I, I mostly know the literature for, you know, pre-processing Twitter text in English, you know. And uh, I guess that uh, from that literature, from that paper, you can pick up several different cues on how to do it in a language different from English. But that's, I recognize it's a super big problem. Other questions? Then uh, lunch.